What's up guys, Doug Polk here, and today we're going to be talking about my thoughts on Daniel Negreanu's game from this challenge. Now we're going to be going through all the different spots you can play in poker. I'm going to be giving him a, a rough grade in, in how well I think he played, as well as talk about some of the things that I found in terms of either leaks that he had, or rather uh, stylistically the way that he played, and just some general overall thoughts. We're also going to run through a few hands to highlight some of the main principles that I think are at play uh, to show you guys exactly what I'm talking about in some different situations that did not reach showdown. But before we jump into all of this, I do want to say quickly that if you're interested in a free training video of me talking about some of my favorite hands from this challenge that did not reach showdown, you can head over to upsyncpoker.com. All you have to do is sign up with your email and you'll get a free coaching video talking about some of my favorite spots. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into what do I think about Daniel's game overall. And there's a lot of different parts of Heads Up No Limit. There's your pre-flop ranges, there's your pre-flop sizes, there's your flop sizes, there's your flop frequencies, there's frequencies on every street, there's your ratio of value bets to bluff. There's so many, so many, so many different things. So I'm going to try and talk about a lot of different ones and maybe we can start to get you guys start to get an idea of uh, the way that he plays and exactly how good Daniel is at Heads Up No Limit. Now I want to start off with this because I think that there's a lot of people online when they watch this match where they see that Daniel lost a lot of buy-ins in this challenge, they think, well, he's probably not good at heads up the limit. And I really do think that Daniel played exceptionally well for what I would have expected from someone coming from his background coming into this. It's a completely different beast when you play heads up. You have to play, you know, more or less the vast majority of your hands, you're going to get constantly put in tough spots. You're going to have to make some light calls. You're going to have to make some some um, sharp bluffs. You're going to have to constantly be attacking pots, and you're going to have to get out there and fight for it. Now, I don't think he was quite ready for this, you know, this degree of, of, of battling. I think that when you come from a, a live poker background, tournament background, and then you're just thrown into this, I think it's a very hard jump to make. But I do think that Daniel played exceptionally well, considering that his background did not have much experience in this format. And from a lot of the frequencies that I had my team track, which was legal, we decided to allow that uh, a few weeks of the challenge, I found that he played relatively good in most situations. So there's not going to be too many spots where I think that you know, Daniel played really badly. Uh, there's a couple spots that I think he played poorly, but overall I found that his game was at least reasonably solid in a lot of different places. But there's one main thing about his game that I think really held him back for the first half or two thirds of this challenge or so. And I think he was just too conservative with being willing to put in all of the money. I think that was something that that was pretty consistent throughout the majority of the challenge. And I actually think that he played a lot better down the stretch when he realized if he didn't make some moves, he was going to lose. And it kind of let him free up, uh, free up his thinking to be more aggressive, to go after pots, put me in spots. And, you know, I, I think it, it really it really made him play much stronger. And, and I'm sure you know if we do end up being able to get these hands at some point that uh, we would see that in the results, but also in the non showdown and hands one all of those kinds of things so in terms of uh daniel's overall gr game what i would give him in total i'd say I, i'd give him let's just call it a, a b or a b plus i think is probably a good a good rating i think daniel would beat anyone that is not an experienced heads up no limit pro i just don't think they would have much of a chance um i do think that uh, people that play heads up for a living would have an edge on daniel but again he did come a long way for his background, and, and I think that that definitely should be admired. Uh, I, I do think that Daniel's call frequencies tended to be a little bit more close to optimal than his bluff frequencies over the challenge, meaning I think if I ran a bluff in a spot, I would anticipate his calling frequency to be relatively more accurate than if Daniel barreled off in a spot and I was looking at a call. I think. Typically speaking, Daniel tends to fall into a, a style that's a little bit more based around making a lighter call in a spot if he thinks you're bluffing, than making a lighter bluff if you know he's not he's not familiar with the scenario. And, and I think that this ended up playing to a bit of a detriment for Daniel, uh, where he just didn't have. You know, especially early in the challenge, middle of the challenge, he just wasn't bluffing enough. He wasn't being aggressive enough uh, across the board. He was picking some spots, right? You know, he definitely knew that there are situations he has to bluff, but he wasn't consistently aggressive enough in a lot of different situations that I think he really needed to be in order to in order to win. 
And if you don't bluff enough, there's a second order effect that happens, right? Let's say that Daniel's not going for it in enough spots. Well, now when he does check, he's weaker. So even if he wants to call me light, he's still going to get bluffed because he has too many weak hands. So the bluffs in my range will over-realize because too many weak hands are reaching certain points. And it kind of snowballs and makes a bunch of problems for Daniel that are going to be really hard for him to overcome. I think the peak point of understanding this concept of the way that he was playing was the, the, the stretch we had in the middle where he didn't get stacked for a couple thousand hands. That should just basically never happen. I think you should be, you know, never is a strong word, but to not get stacked over that long of a stretch, that can only really happen if you're putting it in with very strong hands. And that just kind of shows sort of the the overall place I think Daniel's game was at, at that time. And, and I do wonder if he had played closer to this version we saw at the end, would this challenge have been a lot closer? I, I, th I think it probably would have been. Uh, obviously, there are new problems when you play uh, a more aggressive and loose style. Obviously, you're more prone to make mistakes that are on the loose side. Lord knows I made plenty of those this challenge. But I do think that it would have been more competitive if he had not been so limited by some of the framework of trying to make sure he picked the right bluffs. And, and I think that that really might be what it boils down to. He didn't want to have dumb bluffs. You know, he wanted to make sure he picked good bluffs, which sounds great. But the problem is heads up is so complicated. Poker is so complicated that if you're only looking for the really, you know, for sure, perfect, safe bluffs, you're just not going to bluff enough. And that's why in my game, I always try to bluff enough uh, or call enough, even if sometimes the hand I was bluffing with, eh, not a huge fan of this, but sometimes you just need to make sure that you're throwing it in there just to keep your balances, uh, your frequencies balanced. All right, so we're going to give Daniel's game overall a B plus. We'll say that his uh, calling game is, is, you know, ability to decipher through his hands and call appropriately is somewhere in the B plus, A minus territory, uh, and the bluffing portion of his game is more around the B minus, maybe C plus, and then towards the end, maybe a little bit a little bit higher than that. Um, but now let's talk about some specific parts of his game. Let's kind of hone in on different parts of the game tree so that we can understand it a little bit better. I want to start off talking about preflop. Now preflop obviously is a very important aspect that heads the limit, and it kind of boils down to two different things. The sizes that you choose to go, uh, and the frequency and ranges that you decide to put into those, uh, into those ranges. Overall, Daniel did an extremely good job here, and I'm sure a lot of his his a lot of this was his team prepping it. For most of the challenge, he showed down uh, very reasonable ranges. Uh, there is some stuff that you know differs from the ranges that I have. I can't go too specifically into that really because it's the team that I worked with. Um, I don't I don't think it's fair for me to put out what what the information they gave me was but the point is that he did pick some some stuff that was a little bit questionable uh he seemed to be three fiving some low pocket pairs at a frequency that i don't think was was probably good uh in fact on 100 big blinds you shouldn't really be three betting hands like threes that often uh, if at all and he three five those a bunch versus me which i don't think was particularly great also he was four betting ace queen off which at 100 again is not a super great play i don't know if that was maybe some exploits because i was flatting a lot of four bets maybe he was trying to make sure that he could capitalize on my flats um that also kind of jumped out at me but you know his opens so opening he did a little bit of 2.4 that's a good open size he did some 2.5 very similar value on those so those are both of course completely fine uh so that was good um his three betting size it made sense. He he did a uh, a smaller three bet um, versus me in some spots, bigger in some others. I think he played well with that one. His four betting size, he did a, a large four bet size, which I think could definitely be good as well. You know, m more or less all of his strategy from the size perspective, I think, was good, and most of the hands showdown made sense. But I do think that there was maybe some three fiving that was too light. Uh, and, and there were definitely some hands that were some questionable three bets. I don't know if maybe some of that was down the stretch. He needed to kind of get back to even. He had to, you know, make some stuff happen. So he started three betting some weird hands. But he three betting with some hands that should simply just not be three bets. So I, unless he was trying to exploit me in some fashion or he was just trying to make something happen, then, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm just going to assume that he was just trying to make something happen with the amount of hands left. Uh, but overall, his, his pre bet game was, was quite good. It was actually... You know, one of his stronger attributes was was playing correct pre flop. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, let's talk about the different types of pots. So, in poker, there are really six kinds of pots: single raise pots, and then in position out of position; three bet pots, in position out of position; four bet pots, in position out of position. And uh, obviously, those all function very differently. Um, of course, the in position player is going to have the advantage in all of them because you get to go last. Uh, but 
you know, the, the kinds of, of things that you need to be aware of and be thinking about, they change pretty drastically from one to the next. So sometimes players can be significantly stronger in one of those areas compared to some of the other ones. Let's start off with talking about single race pots. Single race pots are the bread and butter of Heads of No Limit. They're going to be by far and away the most common spot. It's when one player opens, one player calls. Typically in Heads Up, one player will open 80-85% and the other player is going to call, uh, depending on the open size, between 65 and 80%. So you can tell those are big numbers, definitely going to be a lot of hands that you're going to want to be playing. Actually, sorry, they're going to defend somewhere in that vicinity, they'll probably call somewhere around 60%, 55%, whatever it is point remains the same there's going to be a lot of hands that go raise call and so it's really important to be good in these now the thing about single raise pots is that they are the smallest pot right so while they happen the most they are the smallest uh so it the overall value of this compared to other other types of parts of your game um it will still be very important but because it's for less money it probably works out to be uh roughly even compared to how good you want to be in all the different types of pots Anyway, single raise pots, I want to talk about Daniel's button first. Uh, I think he did a, a relatively good job in the button. I think that that part of his game was fairly strong. Um, he chose a lot of good flop sizes. He moved around a lot on his flop sizes by board texture, but I think by the end he had some really, really, uh, really astute sizes on a lot of different boards. They ended up actually being similar to mine in a lot of ways. He did have a few subtle differences, but I thought that they were all within the realm of reasonable. Uh, and I liked the strategy that he was choosing in terms of what sizes he was looking to bet on some of these different boards. Uh, I do think that his bet, 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 uh, his triple off frequency seemed to be pretty good overall. There were a few weird spots in that line. There were some hands where he would bet twice that I did not think made sense. There was a hand where he bet sixes on ace, ace, queen, nine or something like that. Um, and we saw a few hands like that. I saw some ace high barrels in some similar spots where he would bet ace high twice. And usually the solver is going to really not like doing that. You know, why, why bet with a hand that has showdown twice to where now you don't have showdown? It doesn't really make a lot of sense and the solvers tend to not like those spots. Uh, I do think that Daniel tripled a lot. Uh, overall, he was pretty aggressive on going for value in some of those situations. But, you know, sometimes he would make a check that is a bit peculiar. There was one where he, he fought the nut flush draw, and I think he revered a queen, and he checked it back with ace-queen. Uh, that, uh, you know, really he should have been value betting, and he decided to check it back. And uh, I think I think some spots like that, maybe Daniel sees a little bit too much of, you know, the monsters in the closet. Uh, yes, there was. I think it was like a Jack-8 uh, low-card, low-card queen board, something like that. Yes, of course, I can have 10-9, but I, I rarely do. I mainly have a Jack or an 8, and I think in that hand I had an 8, if I recall. Maybe I had a Jack, I forget. The point is, you have to be pretty aggressive on tripling. And I'm not totally sure if Daniel was bluffing in that line enough. It's possible he was. I just mainly got to see the value bets when I called down. But he, uh, you know, he really didn't show a lot of bluffs down to me in that line. But I, I did find some. So it, it, it's possible that he was completely balanced in that line and his frequencies were good. So I'm going to go ahead and give him an A overall for his tripling aspect of his game. I thought that that was relatively solid. I also think early on he tended to have some sizes that didn't make sense. But by the end, he wasn't doing that. And he was using a lot of overbetting on the river in spots that really made sense, which is, again, something you should definitely be doing. I was doing that at the start. By the end, he was doing it as well. An example board might be, I think we had one where... He opened, I called, the board was something around, you know, queen, four, deuce, I check called, turn jack, check called, over 10, I check, and he goes all in, which is a very good play, because the button can have all the straights, and the big blind really can't. By the end, he was doing this stuff uh, relatively frequently, I think it was probably, you know, given how often he was doing it, it was probably fairly balanced, and uh, I think he did a good job here, I think overall that was one of the stronger portions of his game post-flop, was kind of picking out those spots. If you check back the flop... Uh, I think I think overall he played well versus turn probe. So turn probe means flop goes check check, uh, and then I bet the turn. I think overall, based on the numbers that I had for my team, he played relatively strong against uh, turn probe and river probe. Um, so I think he played pretty well in those lines. Uh, I will say if it went check check flop check check turn and I bet the river, I think he probably folded a little bit too much there. I don't think he trapped enough hands by checking back the turn. So uh, I think that was a spot he could definitely improve on a little bit. But it's also tough because he folded a lot there, but I used some very big sizes in that spot. In fact, there's a lot of 200% pot, which 
if you use that, the button's going to have to fold a lot. So it's possible that he was playing relatively well there. But if I had to pick, you know, some of the weaknesses that I think that, you know, he faced in some of these spots, I think that the uh, river probe was probably one of his weakest attributes. And another thing that I think really haunted Daniel in position of this challenge was just, just being afraid to get to get check raised uh, or or have me bet small he raises and I re-raise. We saw a bunch of hands where I would bet small or I would check and he would check back or call with a hand that really just has to raise. It just has to raise. And the reason it has to raise is that if he doesn't better raise those hands, then um, essentially he can't really bluff, right? And he'd be worried about uh, getting re-raised. There was a hand where uh, I think I, I think I either bet small or I checked the river with uh, a flush on a paired board with a flush on it and he just checked back the trips or called the trips versus a very small bet and it's just a spot where yeah he owned me because if he had raised or bet then i would have re-raised him and he would have been in a horrible situation with trips but if you're not able to bet trips in that spot it's hard for you to bluff and uh, you're not going to get to win as many pots so that spot i think he really needed some help with i think he was a little bit too he leaned a little bit too much towards oh i don't want to get raised uh and, and and i get where he's coming from it's tough when you're playing opponents that have really really tough out of position games lots of check raising you're always worried that they're going to be check raising you um, their frequencies are good they're balanced you know they'll bluff you you know they'll value bet you you know they'll bomb it they're not afraid to really play for a ton of money in that spot uh, and you don't want to deal with that when you have um, good hands that are amazing hands but you still have to bet you know you just have to bet in those spots and you can't be worried about if my opponent's going to check raise or not you need to bet effectively and then when they check raise think about all your hands categorize them effectively and you know make the calls that you need to make here we're going to talk about an example hand in the spot that i'm discussing uh, before we jump into it i want to say what is on my table so we agreed that we could use the options in the uh, table software that we're using for the challenge so we have a few different things on the table we have a randomizer we have an effective stack number uh, the orange number is just a clock it just it's just basically a timer it just counts out how many seconds it's been since your action uh, and then we also have a action tracking thing that says what the action has been so far in the hand so uh, we agreed to use these things perfectly fine within the challenge uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this hand so uh jack nine here we open sorry he opens we call and we're going to see sort of the exact spot that um i'm talking about but i want to discuss a little bit about the way that negranu interprets the spot because this was one of the small reads that i got over the course of the challenge just in the way that negranu played um obviously jack nine standard pre flat standard turn check um, you could maybe bet it uh, every now and then. If you use a smaller size, you could definitely bet it more often. Uh, and now we're looking at a river, uh, river 10. So in this situation, this is a spot where the button should have, uh, you know, obviously the big one can't have ace queen. So the button has the nuts and the big one does not, right? And this is one small subtle thing that I learned about the way Negreanu played over this challenge is he likes to pick s spots a bit where it's credible. Right, where it's a good spot. And if we look at a lot of the big pots we played in this challenge, they tended to be spots where basically one, the other player can't have a lot of the really strong hands, and he can. So I think that in a situation like this, and this is a spot I've caught in the ground and bluffing many, many, many times this challenge, like three or four times this challenge, I've seen him bluff in this exact situation where he can have ace queen and I cannot. And that's an important aspect of this. But you still need to pick hands that make sense to bluff with. Uh, and we're actually going to see two different concepts that Negreanu has played in this, in this hand that I think are really important that um, Negreanu could have improved a lot with by just playing a little bit differently. First off, just because the spot is good doesn't mean that you should be bluffing a lot more than if the spot is neutral. When you look at a situation, if it's very favorable for one player, then yes, they get to bet more often. And so that does also mean they get to bluff more often. It may be that they don't get to raise more often because it's a good spot, but they get to raise bigger or whatever the case may be. So essentially in this situation, it makes a lot of sense for the button to be raising aggressively and very big because they can have ace queen and we cannot. But, and there's an important but here, ace queen is supposed to quite often bet the flop. Queen nine is in both players' ranges, uh, although realistically I'm going to be betting queen nine a bit on the turn. He's going to be betting on the flop, so it's not super likely for either player. Uh, and then nine seven is pretty unlikely for both players. 
So in this situation, Negreanu recognizes that I'm capped, he's not, and he can have a bunch of good hands. And he has way too aggressively bluffed this spot all challenge. There was a hand early on where, you know, it was a little bit of a different board, but it was the same principle where the big blind was capped, where he raised a hand such as, I think, pocket fives here, which is a really bad bluff candidate because you block hands that you really want me to have. You want me to have a five in my hand. You want me to have five three or um, five deuce or you know, 10, five, or sorry, nine, five, or whatever it is that, that I could have here to bluff with, you want me to have that five. The five is not that often in the value range, but it is mainly in the bluff range. So so pocket fives would just be a terrible bluff here. You know, it just, it's just not a good bluff. You can run it, the solvers aren't going to like it. But early on in the challenge, he did that because it's a good spot. And I think that this is one of the situations that Negreanu spent a little bit too much time thinking about, whether he realizes it or not, uh, where he tried to bluff spots instead of trying to bluff correct frequencies. And let me give you some three pot examples. We'll talk a little bit about that in a bit, but do you guys remember the hand where he threw bet and barreled off on, I think the board was King Deuce, Deuce Ace, four where the flush got there on the river. So in that spot, flop top pairs became weak. I can't have Ace King. I can't have a Deuce. I'm not going to have that many flush draws on that run out, right? Uh, so it looks like a good spot because I don't have a lot of good hands. Well, what about the hand where I had King Jack of Clubs and he tripled off and it was Queen 4 Deuce King 10. I called down with King Jack. Again, good spot. If I have a Queen on the flop, it's a lot weaker now unless I hit two pair, which is pretty unlikely. So it's a good spot. He can have way more ace jacks than me. He can have jack nine and I can't. He can have all the sets I can't. It's a good spot. And this is something I saw pretty consistently. He he seemed, in my opinion, to lean towards picking spots over picking optimal frequencies within his range given his value range, right? It's good to bluff here. I'm not saying it's bad to bluff here. You should bluff here. But I think he was way overdoing it because, again, it was a good spot. And then there were some spots that I think Negreanu really didn't bluff because he felt they were bad spots. So that made these situations very interesting and complex. But let's just take a look at this hand. So uh, we get to the river. I bet. Bet 82% on the river. And now Negreanu gets to think it over. And ultimately, he decides to raise. All right, so he raised 100% of pot here. Now, this is the problem with this situation for Negreanu. He has not raised thin here much at all this challenge. He can raise, you know, he can raise some, some strong hands, of course. He's not going to have 9-7, which, you know, 100% pot definitely showed up more of 9-7, maybe strong two pair. Um, He's not going to have queen nine all that often. I think he should be bang flop with queen nine something around 50, 60, 70 percent of the time. And he's not going to have ace queen all that often. Depending on his flop size, he should be he should have ace queen here something between one fourth the time and half the time. Um, really depends on his flop size, what's going on there. But it could be as low as 15 percent of the time. So he doesn't really have many of those hands. And I also don't think that ace queen really prefers this size. I think either uh, you're going to want to put ace queen to your smaller size so that you can sort of trap and re-raise it, or you're going to use a very big size saying that you do have in fact ace queen. When Negreanu raises here, he's not raising King-10 because he doesn't want to get 3-bet. He's not raising Jack-10. At least, I don't, in, my, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he is raising King-10 here sometimes. But I think he's really just raising straights and maybe, you know, pocket 10s, maybe King-10. But he's raising very thin for... He's raising very... Um, only He's only raising with very strong hands in this situation. So having a 9 here is quite good. If he did occasionally have 9-7, obviously we blocked that. Uh, queen 9 blocked that. Um, 9 is a is a fairly relevant card. Uh, much better to have a queen, of course, but still at the same time, uh, 9 a good card, and then a jack as well. But I mainly just think this is a spot where we're going to want to do a lot of calling because he's just systemically showing that he bluffs too often here. Because, again, it is a good spot. And I want to just... Let's just go back here. And I want to show you what he has. And he has the queen 7. And this is a spot that Negreanu bluffed. This type of hand is a, is a mistake Negreanu made all challenge. And it actually stems all the way back to the live poker challenge. If you guys remember the live session, we were, t we were chatting and playing a hand and then I made a comment and I forget what it was, but it was something, you know, something like I was considering bluffing with a hand that was a pair and a straight blocker. 
and he said, well, why would you bluff with that? You had a pair. Or you had, he made a comment. It was it was a very casual comment, but it said a lot to me because it, it, it basically meant, why would I bluff with this hand when I could bluff with a hand that's a high card hand? And one thing you might have seen is a lot of the times Negrana chose to raise bluff in this challenge, he used the wrong class of hands. Here he's using queen seven. That is not the hand you should be using here. You want to be using a pair on a queen. So for example, you want to bluff raise here a hand like queen 10 or queen eight or queen four. These are the kinds of hands, or maybe a hand like 10-9, you know, or 9-4, that type of hand. And I have not run this hand, so I'm not sure what the solver says, but I'm telling you right now, when you face 82% pot bets, you don't want to bluff with your unpaired hands. You want to bluff with your paired hands. If you bluff with queen four, I'm way less likely to have a strong hand. It's just simple. Fold the bottom, raise the higher ones. So... Negreanu was just not picking bluffs in the right class of hands, and I think that there was a bunch of different spots at this challenge where we saw that, where he bluff raised with high card hands over paired hands that you really need to be choosing. So, um, you know, kind of a combination of factors here, a spot where I'm not sure how thin Negreanu would be willing to go. Uh, it is, you know, good for him to not have a... No, actually, I think having a diamond here is better to raise, because I don't think I'm going bet bet with many, that many diamond hands. So I think queen seven, I think you'd actually prefer to have a diamond to raise here. But anyway, I'm getting I'm getting kind of into the weeds. Um, the, the main point that I'm making here is we see a couple different couple different things about Negrano's play here. Maybe, maybe three different things. This is actually a very good hand to highlight where we see he's um, probably not raising thin enough for value, uh, picking out spots too much, and then using hands with removal that isn't quite optimal for what he's trying to accomplish. Those things said, I do think overall his imposition game was good. So we'll go ahead and we'll give that an A minus. I think I think all in all he he did a good job of uh, attacking a lot of those pots aggressively. I think his delay CVET frequency was reasonable, and he put a decent chunk of bluffs in there. I think he put a decent chunk of bluffs in his double delay, uh, and he was uh, not not easy to get to fold in a lot of these situations. So um, I think I think this was one of the strongest elements of his game, even though maybe his raise frequencies, he was picking out some of the wrong hands, uh, or rather his range range construction. I do think that in, in position single raise pot was fairly good for Negreanu. I think his out of position single raise pot, I think was maybe the worst part of his game because I feel that he really did not think a lot very deep into how am I going to attack versus delay Siva? And delay Siva was one of the almost only exploits that I really did versus Negranu. Now, what is delay Siva? So let's just talk about the whole single race pot thing overall. If he checks, so let's say I raise, he calls, flop comes, he checks. Single race pot is um, first, obviously, of course, you get to you get your choice to see it or not. If I chose to see it, I think Negrandu played pretty well there, and I imagine most of his study time went into that. I thought he check raised a pretty reasonable frequency. Uh, there was there was some check raise hands early on where he check raised me with some hands that should never check raise. That got a little bit lower as we went on. I think he did a good job of check raising me on all of the streets, except the river. I didn't really get check raised. I get check raised on the river once this challenge, maybe maybe once or twice. I think he, I think river check raise, he, he maybe needed to bluff a little bit more, but uh, flop check raise, he definitely got in the mix. Uh, turn check raise, there were some check raises that, um, you know, it seemed he was check raising me a reasonable frequency on that as well. So I think his versus uh, Seabet game was relatively good. Uh, I do think that maybe uh, early on in the challenge, he wasn't calling down appropriately in some of the big bet spots, but by the end, he was doing a great job of it. He, he had to call down uh, towards the end where I think I opened 6 4 hearts, he called. 10 8 5 two diamonds one heart he check called turn ace two hearts now as well as two diamonds i have the flush and a gutter he checks i bet very big he calls river is a um uh, a deuce i think and he checks and i just jam bluffing six high and he calls ace three which was a pure call very good call from the solver really liked his play there so uh, i think he did a good job versus the the c bet portion but I think that there were some real problems for Negreanu when it went check-check, and I, I, I'm hoping we can eventually get the hands so we can see how it went. The problem for Negreanu when it went check-check was he probed too much of his value, and he did not check-call the turn enough, and he did not check-raise the turn anywhere near enough. If the flop goes check-check and you're in the big blind, a lot of things are at play now. You need to bluff enough so that when you do check, you're stronger. You also need to bluff enough so that 
your value bets get paid when you're betting for value. It's just correct poker. But you also have to trap because if you're not check calling traps or check raising traps, the button can bet very fearlessly. And normally I use a bit of a bigger size in some of these spots where he would check, but I used a 58% pot bet here. You might have seen this in a bunch of different spots uh, because his fold frequency was just too high here. He was folding way too much to delay C bet. And then he also was not check raising me. So I could work in a few more thin value bets than normal. I could, you know, that's not that great because he's just folding anyway, but I could do that. And I, I low frequency maybe put a little bit more of that into it. Uh, I could bluff there very aggressively. Um, if he check called, his river fold wasn't that low. So uh, I'd still bluff. I'd use some big size bluffs, some small size bluffs, and some give ups. But I could kind of pick through my bluffs a little bit more accurately on the river, knowing that uh, his range has become considerably stronger here. This is a spot where the Grandu was weak. It's one of the few spots that I really think that he he made an error on. And, and I think a big part of that was he was trying to fight my check back range you know, from the betting perspective, but not from the checking perspective. And this is what's so tough about poker, and this is why it's so hard to be good at this game. If he really tries to go after me with betting, right, betting for value, and he certainly tried to drive the value hammer when he would bet the turn, well, now his checks get weak. So when he checks and I have air, I overrealize, right? And when he bets, yes, he's going to own me a bit more when I do continue, and I'm going to continue quite often. But now all these other hands get to overrealize because he's not defending this spot enough. Honestly, I don't even know how often I got check raised in this spot in this challenge. Maybe a couple percent, if that. He's supposed to be check raising pretty aggressively here. In fact, you probably might have seen I had some hands where I check raised bombed. You know what? Actually, I have just the hand. Let me pull it up and show you guys. All right, here's the hand I wanted to bring up and talk about. I'm actually surprised I managed to find this so quickly, but here we go. Okay, so this is a hand that I played against Negranu that really highlights the point. Negranu never did this in the entire challenge. I'm sure he was working on so many other things that he just didn't have time to think about this. But basically, uh, it goes, he opens, I call pocket threes. Again, not three betting these to jam. Flop goes check check. Ace on the turn, a turn you're going to want to be checking a lot in the big blind. And we check it over to him. He bets half pot, which is fine. I think usually you want to go a bit bigger on the ace, but whatever. And then we check raise big. He bets two and a half big blinds. I bet 20 big blinds, basically saying, hey, if you call this, I'm jamming the river. Okay. Now, you can also use a smaller check raise size here. Uh, there are, you know, some boards that are preferred bigger, some boards that are preferred smaller. Um, I think this board prefers bigger, but it really depends on the board texture and it can change pretty pretty quickly uh but i think in this in this spot this one was the preferred size and i'm saying hey i'm going i'm going for it all here right i know it's very unlikely that he has five three i'm gonna have five three suited for sure pretty i'm gonna have sets i'm gonna have ace four ace deuce ace eight i'm gonna have all these hands and he's very unlikely to have them ace eight is uh betting the flop should be every time ace four and ace two should be at least low to mid frequency betting the flop especially ace four ace two is probably a bit less five three should be mid to high frequency betting the flop and daniel doesn't open five three off suit he opens only five three suited which is a slight difference it'll change the way you want to play this spot so you know i think about all of these things i'm going to check raise here I'm going to check raise some of the value. So if I have a value bet, sometimes I'll bet the turn. If I do check it, I'm going to check raise you big. And then I'm going to layer in bluffs with straight draws, flush draws, uh, and hands such as pocket threes here to really make Daniel's life difficult because he's going to have to play for a lot of the money with a range that's not really going to have that many two pairs. Uh, so we check raise, he calls. Uh, I also want to say I was down four binds at this point, and I was thinking, man, this is going to look so punty if I just get stacked again here. But uh, we do end up jamming the river and uh, Daniel does decide to to lay it down. Uh, I ran this hand afterwards. It's not good. You're supposed to use hands with a five or six in them. Makes sense. Pocket threes actually blocks some call folds. So this was not the approved hand. But this is, this is what I'm talking about, guys. Basically, when you're in hand, sometimes you have to just go for these bluffs, right? And on the turn, what was my RNG when I check raised? Okay, so I RNG to four. So, you know, this is, this is just basically a spot where the, the turn check race was good. He calls, and then on the river, I RNG it again, and I get a six. Okay? So, very low frequency turn, very low frequency river. I'm putting him to the test and making his life very difficult and making it so delay C betting is a lot d more, t more tough for him to do. I never had to face this in the entire t challenge in the, in, the big, in the small blind. I never did. He rarely check raised me here. When he did, it was small. It didn't put a lot of pressure on me. 
this was a spot that he really needed to work on and he really needed to to improve because this is a spot where you can really hammer people that are uh, too conservative in the game tree and it also lets you have bluffs as well as value bets and I think that this bluff really highlights sort of the, my approach to poker which is look I know I need to be bluffing here right uh, I'm unsure if threes are low frequency now because obviously it's clear if I or six is better but if I'm not sure I'm just gonna do uh, a low and a mid frequency bluff I get the six on the RNG we're going for it you know I know I'm gonna have good hands here I know I'm gonna have five six here I know I'm gonna have two pair here I know I'm gonna have a bunch of different hands so even if I'm not entirely sure and ended up being wrong I want to make sure that I'm bluffing enough that's my most important part my most important part of my approach to poker is, am I bluffing enough in these situations? And uh, I think that um, overall, I think we managed to do a good job of that. And I really think that this is a, uh, an area of the game tree Daniel needed to explore and learn and improve on. And he could have uh, been a much tougher opponent to deal with if he had been working in way more calls and way more raises in this in this line. All right, this video has gone on for longer, so I'm going to stick uh, move away from talking about... Um, specific hands and just talk kind of about overall ideas and the way that I thought he played in some of these other spots. So three bet pots, let's talk about that. We talked about single raise pots in position, played well, give it an A minus something in the vicinity. Out of position, some real problems in the delay lines. Maybe it's more in the vicinity of a C C plus. Uh you know, he needed he needed to make my life more difficult uh by by calling enough in some of these spots, raising enough and really fighting for some of those those pots. The about pots, I think Negron did a, a good job in, in both spots overall. I think in the big blind specifically, he did a good job of making sure that he was tripling air. Uh, I saw a good proportion of value to bluff in that. Uh, I think he did a, a good job of making sure that I didn't... Uh, you know, get to run him over. But I do think he did trap too often with hands that were not really good candidates. And we saw this a bunch. We saw this in the live session, one of the first sessions, where he had trips. He threw bet. I called. I think I had queen jack and he had 6 5. The flop came 6 6 king, I want to say. I floated queen jack and then he checked the turn and I bluffed it off. Trapping with trips in those spots is not good because, yes, if I bluff, you will stack me. But if I have a top pair, you don't anymore. So it's much better to barrel trips there, barrel bluffs, and then trap with really strong hands or hands that are just good call down candidates such as aces, right? Or maybe a, a weak king or something in that vicinity. You do not need to allocate very good value bets to traps. And he did that too often in the big blind. I think that was an earlier problem and a little bit less as we went forward. Uh, but even somewhat recently, we had a hand where he three bet with, I think, 10-9 and the flop came 9-9 nine, nine something. And he bet flop, check called turn, check called river. Uh, or maybe river went check check, I forget. But the point is, even later in the challenge, he was doing that uh, a bit too much. If you run solutions for these hands, they do not trap trips very often here because you do need to be able to bluff and value bet those hands. Uh, trips are a nice hand to go bet, bet, bet. You know, try and win all the money. They're three of a kind. They're very nice. That's a big part of my strategy. Uh, try and win all the money with three of a kind. And then you also get to bluff with that same line. So uh, I think he tried to trap me a little bit too much. I would have liked to see him. I think he did a really good job of flop check raising and turn check raising. He did a nice job of, of uh, you know, attacking me in both those lines. Made it a bit hard for me in position to bet. You notice something? If he had done that single raise pot, it would have been much better for him. But anyway, he did a good job in both those. But I think river check raise. I don't think I got check raised river one time at the up pot in this entire challenge. So he definitely needed to to go for it more there. Uh, and and I think I think he just needed to be a little more aggressive with river raising. Probably probably in most spots, but definitely the up pot. I could bet river and not really be that worried about getting check raised. And may, maybe I got check raised once or twice. But it was very rare in this challenge that I got check raised in that situation. And it makes your life a lot easier knowing that you're not going to get check raised often in that spot. Um, so that's out of position. I think overall his C-bet frequency was pretty good. His sizes got really sharp over the course of the challenge. Uh, his barrel frequency seemed pretty good. I, I, I would say I'd give his, his three of pot game out of position, um, you know, something in the vicinity of a B plus. Uh, I, think he did, I think he did a pretty good job there. Um, Maybe, maybe even an A- minus towards the end, but, uh, you know, he, he trapped a little bit too much and he needed to work on some river check raising, but I think other than that, he did a, he did a good job balancing in a lot of those spots, uh, and it was, you know, not easy to bluff him. His full frequencies were good. Uh, I think I think he did a nice job um, in a lot of those hands. Um, in position to be a pot, I think he played a little bit worse. Uh, I would say that he 
Uh, early on in the challenge, I think he had some sizing tells on his raise sizes. It seemed pretty consistent that when he raised small, it was bluffier. When he raised big, it was more value heavy. Uh, I also think that uh, he did a bunch of weird turn jamming this challenge. I know towards the end he was doing that because he wanted to try and get unstuck in the challenge. There was a hand where I had, I had queens and I bet flop on ace, four, three, um, two spades. Turn queen, I bet pot, he jammed. Uh, I called and he had seven, five of spades. Not a good play. Um, there was a hand really early in the challenge where I had top pair on a queen high board. I bet turn, he jammed queen three. Not a good play. Uh, and then there was another hand recently where I think it was 8-8-3 uh, eight, eight, deuce. I bet flop bet turn with jacks and he jammed sevens. Not a good play. So he was just way, 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 way too aggro on those turn jams. I don't know if he was just trying to not let me barrel or what, but yeah, when I'm bluffing, you own me or semi-bluffing, you really own me. But when I have value hands, you just own yourself because now those hands are going to get stacked. But at least if you called, then you might stack my bluffs. Whereas now you're just folding out, you know, you're folding out some equity, which is good, but you're just getting stacked by the value bets while not letting me bluff you in the river. So I, I mean, those those spots, I think, I think in position through a pot, he needed to work on a little bit. Um, he also didn't seem to triple me that much when I threw bet and checked. My my instinct is that he wasn't bluffing that spot enough. Um, and then some of the sizes he used when checked to, I think, I think were a little bit weak. And then some bluff candidates he just needed to fire with that he didn't. There was one where, I think he called it three bit with nine seven of spades, and it was queen eight eight, uh, rainbow or flush draw. I forget exactly. Uh, nine seven, not the flush draw. And he floated the flop with the backdoor flush draw, and nine high, and then it went brick brick, I think. And he, you know, bet the turn, gave up river. It was just a hand he has to bluff. I, I just can't imagine checking that back. So. Uh, he, he did have a lot of other bluffs there, though. I caught him bluffing that spot multiple times. I think his uh, overall, he probably was a little bit under bluffing there, but but did a, a relatively good job from what I saw. But you know, if you're not bluffing that, it makes me think maybe there are spots he's just not you know willing to bluff enough. Um, and again, it's not a good spot, right? The queen eight eight. I could easily have a queen here. Could bet check call the turn. Not a good spot. And and, and it just kind of shows he's thinking about too much in spots, not enough in ranges. Um, for some of these situations. So the red pots overall, uh, I think he, he played it. Um, I think neither spot was bad. I think neither spot was amazing. Um, but I think he did a relatively good job in both these. And you're already seeing how many things he has to sort of piece together here coming from or starting from scratch. Uh, I think he did a, a relatively good job in the pot overall, uh, especially by the end. Uh, I think early on, there were some much bigger problems. There was some 20% turn pot C betting that was very bad. Uh, there was some hands that were very bad. Uh, by the end, I think he, he really had fixed a lot of those leaks. Finally, I want to talk about four bet pots a little bit. When we four bet and he called, I think that in those situations, he was way too timid early mid part of the challenge. By the end, I do think he was going for it, going pretty ham. Uh, so it's tough in those because it's just a small sample. But just my takeaway was he was playing too conservative early on. And then, uh, you know, by the end of it, it loosened up and was playing a, a much stronger game in those post-flop spots. So I think out of position, you know, I'm not even going to grade it. It's just too tough to say. It's just a small sample. But, uh, you know, I, I, I did see some, some interesting bluffs. There was an ace-three of clubs one where it was a monotone flop by trapped aces. And he just bet, 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 turned jammed river. thought that that was good given his uh, pre flat. So I, I think that there are... I think he made some strides there. I think early mid part of the challenge, he just seemed he just seemed so weak in those spots. I don't know if he was just you know playing too tight or whatever it was, but I think he did work on that, and got better over the course of it. Uh, his in position four bet pot game, I, I think he went bet bet check too much. I think that there were a few too many times where he tried to bet his ace high twice to show down, and uh, you know I think he he picked some okay bluff candidates. There was one where he uh, bet and then jammed a turn with ace queen on a king 10x king board but that was a uh, reasonably reasonably solid play so Oliver actually did, did like his play there but he had some river barrels i think he needed to put in put me to the test um i know that there was one recently where he had king deuce and went bet bet check but um i talked about him with that hand and he, he rng at 99 obviously if you're checking out 99 that's fine but just kind of my takeaway was I felt that on the river, he was a little bit too likely to, to check back if he thought I was calling. And, and again, I think it was maybe a little bit too spot based, not enough, just pure, pure range based, which I think is kind of where you want to go. So, so yeah, overall, 
I mean, I've played Negranu for, for three months, so there are tons of things that I, I think and can say, and um, I think I've said sort of the broad strokes. I think if I just go uh, eyeball view on this, and I'm just kind of looking at a lot of the data that my that my team put together, uh, I, I think I think he played I think he played really well overall, especially especially coming from not you know not a heads up background, and he didn't really have a lot of spots where there were uh, leaks to exploit you know the delay c bet was one uh i think bet check bet threw up pot he folded a bit too much there i definitely got away with some block bets that i shouldn't have and uh, early set the frequency i shouldn't have and i think in position he needed to be a little less afraid to to value bet because i think that hurt his frequencies but you know he played solid and and i and i think that a lot of people might think that there was a lot of game plan changes and adjustments and and there there really wasn't there was a few different things i adjusted based on his preflop size every time he would do a new size i would run new sims and solutions and whatever to to have better approximations of the gto response um, from a size perspective but from a frequency perspective i didn't really exploit him much you know i didn't i looked at a lot of timing tell stuff uh there wasn't anything very big in the timing department uh, there was a funny hand early on where uh, I got time. I only had one timing tell in this entire challenge, actually. And it was the 9-7 offsuit hand where I misclick 5-bet. What was funny about that misclick was I actually did misclick the size because I was running out of time and thought he was weak because he just tanked way too long. So it was a misclick, but I did want to re-raise, uh, which is a really funny place to be at. But uh, basically, I think when he 4-bet, early on in the challenge and he took a long time he was reading a chart and so it was just obviously weak if he had aces he would just four bet more quickly uh i think he fixed that as he went along that was the only timing till i got on the on the entire challenge so uh i think i think overall negrano played very good um i think that you know if he worked on some of the things i talked about today would help him a lot i think that he had to overcome sort of his uh intuition that you know, got him far in a lot of other aspects of poker that isn't as good here. And and I think that uh, at the end of the day, he was just not winning enough pots. Uh, if we if we look at this, if we go bird's eye view, if we can never get these hand histories, there's just he just got buried in non showdown. I don't know what my one hand ended up being towards the end. It, it dropped a bunch because I had to play a little bit tighter pre given the side bets and everything. And additionally, he started loosening it up. But I would guess I won 52, 53 percent of hands this challenge, which I just don't think you can you can get away with uh, being the guy that's that's on the other end of that. It's just not enough pots. And I think that uh, he just didn't fight tooth and nail in enough situations to try and win every last pot that he could. And I also think that, uh, you know, the team of guys that he announced coaching him, I feel, you know, not to say anything bad about those guys. I don't know them at all, but I really think that if he had wanted to have the best chance of winning this, he should have gone with some some real some real heads up and element pros that knew what they were doing um i worked with uh, frab xd and button clicker online two of the best heads up guys we did a bunch of coaching ran some stuff worked together improved all these things you know, these are guys that actually crushed the high stakes i i don't see why you would go to people that don't play heads up to learn heads up that seems like an error to me now they did do a good job with a lot of the stuff that they implemented and changed so i'm not saying that you know, they didn't do a good job, but why would you not go to the guys that are the top players? That just, that will just always remain a mystery to me, right? I, you know, you could for sure have made some deal with some of the top guys that could have put you way more in the ballpark of, of uh, what you should be playing rather than guys that, that are probably smart and have good resources, but, but don't have that experience uh, of actually winning at the top level. So anyway, that's my that's my thoughts, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. It's pretty in depth. If you want to learn more from me about some hands that I did play in this challenge, including some of my favorite non-showdown hands, I'm going to be releasing a free video that you just have to sign up for at Upswing with your email, and then you'll get access to that video. And then, um, yeah. So if you're interested in learning more, check that out in the description below. Totally free. Thank you guys for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed it.